Jordan. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm really glad you're here. I, I, I uh, worked with Cheryl on uh, quite a few projects uh, in the school district, and she just does a really wonderful job of uh, sharing some really vital information about how we help our kids stay safe and uh, avoid drug and alcohol use. Uh, so I'd like to thank her for all the work she's put into preparing this, and, and to Jordan as well, because uh, this is the first time we posted a webinar, and they've done a really great job putting everything together and making sure the technology is in place. So I, uh, having not seen any complaints about the sound or the video, I think we're in pretty good shape there. Um, we, uh, this morning, um, Cheryl, as a matter of fact, did a presentation for our student athletes at Lakeland High School, uh, similar to what she did last week over at Milford. And it was really well received. I think we had a couple hundred students there. And um, she did a really great job of putting together um, a program that's really geared toward helping them uh, perform better in their in athletics and academics. And um, I, I thought it was really well done. And, and um, uh, she's just got an amazing way of tailoring uh, her messaging for the audience that she has in front of her. And you're going to really enjoy that tonight. So um, I guess uh, Jordan already told you it was recording. That's part of one of the things I want to tell you. Oh, and also we, we're having a drawing from uh, all of our participants. Uh, we'll do that in the morning uh, once we've got everybody's names down and then we'll notify you about who won some pretty fun stuff from the coalition. So we'll be sending an email out tomorrow. Um, I think that's everything. Jordan, anything else you can think of before we let Cheryl take it away? Um, you will have an email from Jordan Nyduke tomorrow if you are one of our lucky winners for me to get your address that I can send you um, your little prize pack. So we're really glad that you're here. Again, any questions, just go ahead and put them in the chat and then... I will be uh, giving them to Cheryl at the end of the presentation. So um, we're going to turn it over to Cheryl Phillips, who, uh, who uh, this company is, is Health Ed Talks. Um, she has a variety of programs available that she delivers uh, all over the Southeast Michigan. But she's been doing this uh, um, work for, I think, over 20 years now. And she's really an expert in her field. And I, I, I guess I said, you're going to really enjoy this. So Cheryl, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, thanks for inviting me to participate tonight. Really looking forward and, and happy to share this important information with everybody. So let's uh, go through what we are going to go through in the short period of time that we are together tonight. So uh, we're going to talk about what we can do as adults to help keep our kids safe. That's you know obviously why we're here today. We'll talk about risk factors and protective factors, um, how the brain is affected with any substance, and then take some time on some specific substances and what specifically they may do to the body. We'll talk about safes or hiding places. So if you have a concern, some places you might want to check. Um, behavior signs and changes, and then uh, communication techniques. So that's a whole bunch of stuff we're going to wrap into a very short time together. So what can adults do? Right off the bat, just some simple things we can do is continue to learn. I'm going to share a whole bunch of information with you tonight. It's going to fly by really fast, but this is an ever-changing industry. Uh, drug use is not stagnant. It's constantly evolving, and I encourage you to continue to uh, learn and, and, and become educated. Uh, be aware and ask questions. You know, we find that um, when we talk to teens in a very matter-of-fact way, like they're an expert, typically they are more than happy to share their knowledge. So if, you know, you say, you know, I was at this class tonight and they talked about this, you know, whatever it is you bring up, um, what do you know about it? And if your teen doesn't feel like they're going to be accused of anything, they usually they're pretty happy to share the information that they have. We want to take action and we can take simple action or big action. We can uh, volunteer at the coalition at an event that they might be having or simple action is when we go to an event at school, any event, band concert, basketball game, football game, whatever it might be, um, to park a little further back in the parking lot, kind of meander the parking lot a little bit, slowly head our way up there. You know, just an adult presence like that, somebody wandering through the parking lot can help you to use drug use. And then during the game, instead of just sitting at our seat the whole time, get up and walk around, go past the bleachers or the bathrooms, the concession stand where teenagers like to hang out. Again, simple actions all adults can take can help keep everybody's kids safe. We also want to reduce 
risk factors and increased protective factors, which I'm going to talk about next, and communicate. Communicate, communicate, communicate. There's so many different ways and opportunities for us to communicate with our young people throughout the program. I'm going to have little snippets of uh, communication techniques and a couple little hokey videos just to give us a, a little break from hearing me talk. Um, and I know they're kind of hokey, but they, they emphasize different opportunities and ways to open up discussion with our young people. So that, that's what adults can do. So let's talk about risk factors. Research tells us the more risk factors a young person has, the more likely they are to engage in substance use. So we wanna decrease the risk factors as much as we possibly can. So these are examples, a failure in school performance. So that doesn't mean that kids with A's and B's don't use drugs, yes, of course they do. But kids that are failing and don't know how to cope with that failing are more likely to turn to substance use. A history of addiction in the family. You know, we, there is evidence that shows that addiction can be hereditary. And so having those conversations with our young people, not only that um, there was addiction in our family, but if you have somebody in your family who recovered and is leading a healthy life now, kids need to know that. They need to know that if somebody gets in trouble, there is help available and people can get out of it. It's not necessarily a lifelong thing. A perception or approval of drug use in the family. So if adults in that family are using substances, obviously those kids are going to be more likely to. A lack of attachment or nurturing, where a young person doesn't feel that a grown-up has their back. They don't feel like they have support. Uh, lack, of, lack of coping skills. And this has evolved over the last several years. We used to have the helicopter generation where parents hovered over their kids and if their kids fell down, they picked them up. Now we have what we call the lawnmower generation where things are just mowed right out of the way of the kids so that they never actually even fall. And because of that, they don't have the coping mechanisms for when things do happen to them. You know, we talk about the high level of stress and anxiety our teenagers are experiencing today and they really don't know how to deal with that. So teaching our kids coping mechanisms, where support systems are, who they can turn to and how they can deal with that, that's so important. And then ineffective supervision, where parents don't know where their kids are, they don't know the friends of their kids, they don't know what happens in the house of those friends, um, they don't know what social media sites they are on, um, and I know teenagers hate when I say this, but yes, parents, you should be checking up on your kids' phones. You should, on a regular basis, sit down with them and go through and look at what they're looking at and know what social media sites they're on. A lot of drug use happens through social media. That's how kids make connections to be able to acquire substances. So yes, we do need to check up on them probably more than we think we do. So this is a list of some of the risk factors that are out there. And a, a youth that has a lot of these, the high, more they have, the higher they are at risk of eventually using substances. So we wanna reduce these as much as we possibly can. In addition, we wanna increase the protective factors. Again, research tells us the more protective factors a young person has, the less likely they are to engage in substance use. We wanna increase these as much as we can. Things like strong and positive family bonds. You know, families that truly do sit down to have dinner together and all the electronics are off and we're sitting down having eye, co eye contact and conversation, that's a protective factor for your kid. A success in school, or if not, at least a strong bond with some sort of institution. So whether that's a, a, a sports program, a church program, an after school program, something where they feel connected and they feel they belong and they're valued, that is a huge protective factor. Uh, the perception at home that it is not okay to use drugs, that that is the one and only message that they are ever given in their household, that it is not okay. And effective supervision. So parents that really do see their over their oversee their kids' activities, their social media sites, they know the friends, they know the parents of those friends, parents that have clear rules that are consistently enforced, and parents that are involved. They show up, they're the, you know, they, they have the kids back. They're the biggest cheerleader, the number one fan that young person has. So this is our list of protective factors, and this is like the bubble we put our kids in to help protect them. It's not impermeable, it's not perfect, but the more protective factors we have, the less likely they are to engage in substance use. So we want to increase these as much as we possibly can. So with that, we're going to go right into our basics. You know, what is a drug? And by definition, a drug is any substance put in or on the body that causes a physical or psychological change. There's numerous, numerous drugs out there, ones that are very helpful, ones that are harmful, and um, we are finding that youth are even using what are supposed to be helpful drugs in harmful ways. And we're gonna to touch on those tonight as well. 
So one of the biggest talking points, and if you had a kid in school that I talked to this uh, past two weeks, they have seen this. So I encourage you to, to review it with them. Uh, but one of the best talking points as parents we can have is discussing with our kids the brain and how it develops and how any type of substance use as they are growing up can have a long-term negative effect. So in a brief overview, and this is very simplistic, um, our brain, uh, we could kind of say, has three main parts to it in terms of growth. So we have the back of our brain. This part of our brain is responsible for balance and coordination activities. Uh, it fully develops when we're a toddler and we learn to crawl and we learn to walk. And then we have the middle part of our brain. This is our limbic system. This part of our brain is responsible for our moods, happiness, sadness, joy, frustration, love, hope, hate, anger. This part of our brain is fully maturing during our preteen and teenage years. That's why our kids have so many mood swings as they are growing up, because this part of the brain is fully maturing and developing during this time and hormones are flying around, causing those ups and down mood swings. And then the last part of our brain is our prefrontal cortex. This part of our brain is responsible for all the skills our kid actually needs to move out someday and live as an adult on their own. So logic, language, discernment, decision-making, reasoning, rationalization, understanding, it's all in the prefrontal cortex. Now our brain matures from the back to the front. So that prefrontal cortex, those logic centers, that's the last section of our brain to completely mature and develop. And as research has shown us, it takes a long time. It takes till we are about 25 years old before that brain is completely mature and it has all the skills somebody needs to be a functioning adult in society. So during this time, during these preteen and teenage years, all day, every day, we have these neurons in our brain that are constantly making connections to other neurons in our brain. And where that connection happens is we have these two neuron end cells right next to each other where they meet, they don't actually touch, there's a space in between them. That is called our synapse space. And when chemicals are passed from one nerve ending over the, to the, that synapse space to the other nerve ending, that's when that connection is made. You know, that's when the kid is able to solve the math problem or understands the new language or is able to do the new athletic skill. It's like uh, that aha moment, that's what's going on there. Now, when that's trying to happen and another chemical is introduced there, like a drug or any, any substance like a drug, it's going to have a negative impact on the connection. Either the connection's not made at all, or it's made faulty, or it's made with an addiction to the drug. And so then at 25 years old, those people who engage in substance use during their preteen and teenage years, it's very possible that that prefrontal cortex does not completely develop like it's supposed to. And they may truly not have all the skills they need to be a functioning adult in society today. So while our youth can argue with us all day long about different substances and about what adults do or adults don't do, bottom line is their brain is still growing and they can't really afford to be damaging it as it's growing by putting substances in their body. So that's one of the biggest talking points that most kids can kind of understand when we're um, having the debate or discussion about substance use. Other things in general to consider, uh, the discussion points with our kids, you know, uh, minor possession. If a kid is, and, ends up bringing any sort of product to school and they get a ticket, that could mean going into court and that's a whole nother ball of wax and, and what happens there. Um, college admissions, you know, if, if your teenager is uh, thinking about going into, going into college and they fill out their college admission papers, those of you with juniors and seniors might have already seen this. You know, there's a question on there, have you ever been suspended from high school? So if a teenager ends up getting involved in substances and gets caught at school with them and gets suspended, then that's obviously a negative impact on their college application. And social media, more and more agencies, not only college admission officers, but military, law enforcement, employers, do look at uh, social media sites. So just reminding our young people how important it is to keep their social media footprint clean and make sure they're not posting pictures of themselves or they're allowing their friends to post pictures of them, engaging in activities that wouldn't be, um, that they wouldn't want a potential employer or college admission officer to see. And then of course costs, you know, substance use isn't free. And if our teenagers have the kind of money it costs to actually afford a drug habit, we know there's better things that they can do with the, that, those dollars. So helping them find uh, better ways to spend the money that they do have other than substance use. So multiple uh, levels to consider related to this. So now we're gonna start off a little bit with ways um, drugs can get into the body. So there's five different methods that uh, route drugs can get in. One is absorption. So that's just through the skin. And then we have orally where somebody puts it in and in, in ingests it. Um, snorting, whether in, inhaling it up the nose, 
uh, injection of needle through the skin and inhalation where they're breathing it in. So five main ways substances can get into the body. And we're gonna start our discussion with specific substances today talking about the gateway drugs. Uh, gateway drugs are substances that are often used first by young people, such as nicotine, alcohol, inhalants, prescription drugs, and we could even put marijuana in here too. Um, so, you know, if, if there's a, a place like Party Central where if a teenager comes, they can get any drug that they want, typically they're not going to run over to a heroin table and jet, grab a needle and jab themselves. Now, that's not typically how drug use starts out. Often it starts out with something that seems safe, that is legal, that they've heard about before, that other people use. Typically, it's one of these substances first. But if that young person keeps coming to Party Central over and over and over again, eventually these substances are not going to give them the excitement that they did originally, and then they may step in, up into using other um, harder illegal substances. And these substances in and of themselves are not safe to be using anyway. Okay, so before we get into our very first drug we're going to talk about today, here's our first communication uh, tip. It's about establishing and maintaining communication about anything and everything. So again, I know these are kind of hokey videos, but I hope they help you understand there's different ways and many opportunities for us to communicate with our young people. How was school today? It was fine. Oh, they had these police dogs come in today. We had to leave class. They sniffed our backpacks and lockers. Really? Yeah, I think they were looking for drugs and stuff. Interesting. What do you think about that? Well, they were probably looking for marijuana. I don't understand the big deal. It's just a plant, it's legal, and there are worse drugs out there. True, there are worse drugs. However, marijuana isn't okay, especially for young people with their growing brain. Any drug can have a negative impact on a teen or young adult. And just because it's a plant and legal does not mean it is safe. I know, I know. You know I don't use it, right? Yes, I believe you don't. I am proud of you for the decisions you make and doing your best to make healthy choices. So that's our, our, our first little vignette or, or um, example there. So you know, again, establishing, maintaining communication about anything and everything. And remember, this is lifelong. You know, we don't just start having conversations with our kids when they're a teenager. It's something that we do their whole life long. Um, it's an opportunity where we can share our values and expectations about substance use or anything else with our kids. We want to make sure that we are sharing. They may not agree and they may not end up growing up with the same values and expectations we have, but it's important that they hear from us what our values and expectations are, that we're not just assuming that they already know. Um, validating, you know, validating the young person for their thoughts and their ideas and their opinions, that's important. Uh, using building blocks versus roadblocks when we're having discussions or when we have to enforce any sort of consequence with them. And using teachable moments. And there's so many teachable moments out there. You know, this one was uh, throwing a ball in the yard. Windshield time is a great teachable moment. And that's, you know, when you're in a car with a kid and you're just having a conversation, they know you're not staring at them because you're driving and they, they're staring out the window. That can be a more comfortable situation to have a conversation in about substance use or any other tough subject. But establishing and maintaining communication is, is a real important first step in uh, continuous conversations with our young people. So we're going to go to our first lessons tonight in that of nicotine. And nicotine comes in various forms from cigarettes to cigars to chewing tobacco to vapes and pipes, whole different ways uh, that their nicotine is, can be ingested. And we're going to focus first on vaping. And here's uh, a simplistic graph about vaping numbers for the last six years, going from 2019 to 2021. And you can see it's kind of gone up and down. And in 2019, the green column, that's when vaping really um, spiked. And it was all about all we heard about in the news. And a valley disease came out and people were hospitalized from vaping and people were dying from vaping. And there was still a lot of questions about it. Was it THC? Was it uh, vitamin E acetate? Was it nicotine? There's a lot of questions and it was forefront in the news. And then COVID hit and kind of we stopped hearing about vaping in the news so much anymore. And the um, National Youth Tobacco Survey attempted to continue their survey in uh, 2020 when schools all shut down and the numbers went down. And so they're still not sure if that was um, because vaping did start to die down or if it's because schools closed down and they get the data that they normally acquire. And then the, the 2021 data came out 
And they say it's really not comparable to the data beforehand because they did it mostly electronically and it wasn't done in a school setting. So the numbers show that the less people, less teenagers are admitting that they vape. This could be great and it could be totally skewed. We don't really know. But even if it is on its way down, which is what we hope, we hope the graph is actually accurate and it's on its way down. We still have a long way to go because this still tells us we have over 2 million middle schoolers and high schoolers that are choosing to vape on a regular basis and are freely admitting that they're choosing to vape on a regular basis. So there's a lot more education to be done on this topic um, so we can get those numbers way, way down. So what vaping is actually the use of an ENDS unit, ENDS, Electronic Nicotine Delivery System. These products were developed in China around 2004 and they came to the United States in around 2006. They exist primarily to put nicotine into the human body. That's why they were manufactured and sold originally. Now the original manufacturers could see a world of people addicted to the chemical of nicotine, hundreds of thousands of people dying every single year from nicotine addiction and cigarette smoking. So their goal was to give the people that were smoking an alternative, something that was deemed safer and healthier than an actual cigarette. So when vapes first came out, they looked like smoking products. They looked like pipes, they looked like cigars, they looked like cigarettes, because that was the target audience. People who are trying to quit smoking and switch over to vaping to support and help them to do that. And then came along what I call some very unscrupulous business people who then could see the amount of money being made off this product and started to think, well, how do we get new users? How do we get people who never smoked before to start vaping? How do we get younger people involved in this product? You know, thinking only about the money involved. And so what they did was they started advertising campaigns that made vaping look fun and exciting, uh, using models that were very young. Um, you know, obviously the models in these ads are not adults trying to quit smoking. And that was the goal of the advertising company, to make it look like this is fun and hip and you should try it too. And then the flavoring agents, you know, there's over 7,000 flavors of, of vape juice out there. Most of them are not targeting people trying to quit smoking again, they're targeting young people. You know, it, when you have bright, colorful, fruity flavored packaging, you are targeting a different audience than you are somebody who's trying to quit smoking. In addition, they came out with new and um, unique vaping apparatuses, so they didn't just look like smoking products anymore. You know, when you have things that look like pens and markers and credit cards and lipstick cases, that, again, is not targeting our adult smoker. That's targeting young people to try to get them to engage in this product. Some of the other things out there that you might need to be aware of, um, one, they have stickers to bling up uh, vape apparatuses. They have uh, a watch that looks like, uh, uh, looks like a watch. It's actually a vape in disguise. Uh, key fobs are out there that look like vapes. Um, lipstick cases again, and then hoodies. So the, the hoodie from vapeware, the, the tube going through it is actually, the string going through the hood is actually a tube. So they can connect one end to the vape apparatus and stick it in their pocket and pull the other end out and look like they're chewing on it when they're actually vaping. So things to be aware of, there's very unique ways to hide vaping um, apparatuses. And some of the more popular that are st still popular ones that are still out there are the Soren, which again is about the size of a credit card or teardrop shape. The picture in the bottom right hand corner here I have, because um, usually when a teenager gets a vape, it's not a brand new one out of a box. It's one that they got from somebody who got from somebody who got from somebody. It's been handed down several generations of people. Oftentimes it doesn't come with the charger that originally came with it in the original box. So if you see cords or wires cut up or uh, those chargers that people will take to go charge their phones, and different wires hooked onto them, that could be a red flag that your teenager has a vape and they're trying to find a way to recharge that apparatus. So that's a red flag for sure. Some of the most common vapes that are um, out there right now among for a teenager, again, still the Jewel. The Jewel is very popular. It's still very popular because the pod for the Jewel, which is those little rectangle boxes with the colored lids on them, they are disposable, so once you use one, you throw it away, you just get a new one, so it's not messy, you don't have to refill it. And then the puff bar, which comes in flavors, um, and again, you just throw it away when you're done using it. So these are two very popular vape products that are still out there that you should be aware of, and this is what you might be looking for if you're suspecting your teen is vaping. Just to give a brief overview of how vape works, because that gives us some tools to talk about um, the, the potential dangers. 
Um, so no matter what size or shape they are, they all work the same way. There's that mouthpiece somebody inhales off of. Below that is the tank or chamber that holds the liquid. Inside that is what's called the atomizer. That's a piece of metal with cotton wrapped around it. And then there's the battery source. So when the battery is activated, it heats up that little piece of metal, which heats up the liquid inside, turning that liquid then into a vapor or aerosol, which comes out the mouthpiece at the top. So they all operate in the same manner. Um, and then again, when somebody's recharging it, it can also uh, catch on fire and explode, which, which has happened before. The vape juice that young people are using, that anybody's using, contains four primary ingredients. We have propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin, the flavoring agents, and the nicotine. So no matter uh, if they somebody's making it at home or they buy it from a store that where it's been manufactured, they typically contain these same four ingredients just in different quantities. And when these four ingredients are mixed together and heated up in that vape apparatus, they convert, chemical reaction takes place. So coming out the top of the vape isn't just these ingredients anymore, we have new things. We have what we call volatile organic compounds or VOCs. And some examples of VOCs you might be aware of, one is toluene. Toluene is the main ingredient in paint thinner. So people are in essence inhaling paint thinner when they're choosing to vape. They're inhaling benzene, which is in car exhaust, acrolein, which is a highly regulated herbicide, formaldehyde, which we preserve dead bodies with in the morgue. So those are just a couple examples of VOCs that people are choosing to inhale. Along with VOCs, they're inhaling heavy metals, and that's from that little atomizer coil in the apparatus. Every time it's heated up, microparticles of it flake off. So people are inhaling microparticles of metal into their lungs with every inhale on a vape. And then the flavoring agents, and we're finding out some of these actually become toxic to the human body when they're heated up. So more studies are being done on the flavoring agents themselves. And then of course the nicotine, which we know is the ingredient that continues um, or that starts the addiction and keeps people coming back for more. So this is just a handful of the chemicals we know that people are choosing to put into their body when they're choosing to vape. Many teenagers don't realize what this actually is. And in terms of the original intent of vapes, you know, to give it a healthier alternative for people who are trying to quit smoking, what I will say is I was at the National Convention, I'm sorry, International Convention in Washington, D.C. It was done virtually, but hosted out of Washington, D.C. Uh, and people from around the world were there, scientists and physicians uh, all around the world were there going, talking in sessions about this. And among the science and medical community, they are still in debate about whether this is a harm reduction strategy for people who smoke. There are people who very adamantly say, yes, if you are a smoker, you should switch to vaping because it is definitely safer for you. There are people who uh, contradict that and say, wait, we don't have enough evidence. We're not sure we should do that yet. So the, community, the bigger medical and scientific community is still in the debate of whether this is safer than smoking a cigarette or not. However, universally, one thing every single person at that conference could agree on is that vaping is not safe in general. It's not a safe habit to pick up and start. So if people are not already trying to quit smoking, they should not engage in this. And it definitely has negative impacts for teenagers as they are growing up. Universally, that is agreed upon. And some newer research that came out uh, also indicates that teenagers that do vape are three times more likely to start smoking cigarettes at some point. So teenagers can predispose themselves to cigarette smoking by choosing to start vaping. And of course, we know the dangers of cigarette smoking. You know, we know it's highly addictive. You know, 90 percent of adults that smoke today began before the age of 18. The nicotine chemical, when it gets in that brain synapse connection, is extremely, extremely powerful and ca can cause addiction very, very quickly. And we know the dangers. There's over 7,000 chemicals in every puff of a cigarette. 70 of them are known cancer-causing agents. We have 480,000 people that die every single year from cigarette smoking. Some of the newer things out there related nic to nicotine uh, that you should also be aware of. One is the pixotine. Excuse me. Those are toothpicks that have nicotine in them. So they can be ordered online illegally, but they can be ordered online or gotten from a friend or a store. So if your kid's chewing on toothpicks, you might want to check on what's on that toothpick. Is it a nicotine infused toothpick? There's also THC or marijuana infused toothpicks, so something to be aware of. And then there's those things called Nikki drops. Those are like throat lozenges, hard candies that also contain nicotine and again are fairly readily accessible. So just being aware of the other products out there that contain nicotine that teenagers may be engaging in. You know, a few other things related to nicotine specifically, addiction again is high, but we also know it can cause brain circuit disruption long after people quit using it. 
Um, so as adults, people who smoked as teenagers can have a higher rate of learning and cognitive deficits of mood disorders and loss of impulse control. And just one final thing on vaping, um, the law changed in 2019 and it added possession to the law that wasn't there prior to 2019. So in the state of Michigan, anyone under the age of 18 cannot not only not purchase, but cannot have in their possession any part of a vape, so a charger, an apparatus, a vial of vape juice, a disposable vape, they cannot have it in their possession or they can be cited by law enforcement. In 2019, there also came out a federal law and they focused on the retailers and said stores can no longer sell any sort of tobacco or vape product to anyone under the age of 21. And this is a resource that I know Randy and Jordan have and you can reach out to the coalition. If you have a teenager who is vaping and trying to quit vaping, there are resources out there to help them. These are two that are online where a teenager can vape with a quit coach to help them pick a date and give them the support they may need to be able to quit. In terms of nicotine in general, for the red flags that are out there, if you're a parent, you might be a concern. Uh, you know, obviously, if they're smoking, you're going to smell smoke on their clothes or find lighters or matches lying around. Um, if you're vaping, it might be fruity smell because many of the vape juices are, have a fruity candy smell to them. Or if you find eyedropper bottles, empty pods, uh, wicks or packets of wire. If someone steps up to a um, non-disposable vape, they may try to re rewire it. Uh, the atomizer coil, and so they might find packets of wire or um, cotton. Also cover up scents. If you smell a lot of gum, a lot of mouthwash, a lot of cologne, um, things that they might be trying to use to cover up the scent of something you're doing, that is definitely a red flag. All right, communication tip number two. I don't have a video for this one, but this is about having clear rules and consistently enforced. You know, uh, it's a teenager's job really in life to push the envelope, to really try to push the rules and see how far they can go. And it's our jobs as adults to make sure that there's the red line they cannot cross without consequences. And anytime we can have an agreement with them, uh, you know, a brief example is getting a cell phone or getting uh, their driver's license. And we sit down and we have a conversation about what this means and what the rules are related to these things. And then if we can get our teenager involved in helping us develop the consequences for the rules, where they have some buy-in and ownership and they understand the rule and they know what's gonna happen to them if they break the rule, then it makes it a little bit easier for mom and dad to have to enforce the rule if and when they cross the line. So uh, clear rules consistently enforced and if we can get our kids involved in making the rules, that's all the better. Next substance is alcohol, which is still one of the most prevalent substances our teenagers are using both in high school and college campuses, many nicknames related to them. Just a reminder that a drink is a drink is a drink. So whether it's a shot of alcohol, a glass of wine or a glass of beer, a drink is a drink is a drink. One will get someone just as intoxicated as the other. There are a few exceptions to the rule, of course, but in general, they're all the same. Uh, alcohol is a depressant. It slows down the central nervous system. It slows down the messages from the brain, which is why it causes slurring of speech and loss of coordination because everything has been slowed down. About 50% of accidents in our country today are caused by alcohol. Um, the challenge with alcohol in our young people is that it's a common denominator in society in many different activities. So anytime we can have activities as a family that don't involve alcohol and show our kids that they can have fun without drinking, that's a bonus. Because when they look out in life in the world, a lot of times when people are having fun, alcohol is involved in one way, shape, or another. Um, the trends related to alcohol right now that are out there, other orifices, and quite frankly, what this means is teenagers will douse tampons in alcohol, typically it's vodka, and insert them anally or vaginally. And you might think, why? Why would a teenager ever think to do that? And it's because they, um, you can't smell it on their breath, so they could walk right by you and you wouldn't necessarily know. They also get intoxicated quicker because it bypassed the digestive system. Uh, energy drinks, our teenagers realize alcohol is a depressant and so they may try to counteract that by drinking a lot of high, high caffeinated beverages right along with their alcohol. Candy, primarily gummy candy like gummy bears, they do absorb alcohol so sometimes uh, people will soak them in vodka and then go around just eating gummy bears getting many shots of alcohol. And then drinking games, you know, beer pong it, uh, is one of the most popular drinking games where they bounce the ball along the table and it lands in a cup and they have to drink. So games are, are very prevalent as well. So again, having conversations about this, also having conversations with our young people about 
what do you do if you're in that situation where the person you're supposed to ride home with has decided to drink? You know, how to get yourself out of that situation? Uh, what are some uh, things you can do? What are some phrases you can say? And I really encourage parents to role play with their teenagers, especially those getting close to driving age, and really talk about this and have them role play it. Because if they're in that situation, they might know, okay, I shouldn't get in the car, I shouldn't get in the car. But they might not have the language or the or the terminology or the action to take to prevent themselves from getting in that situation or from getting in that car. So role playing it with them, giving them several options and having them practice it. So if and when they are in that moment in time, they've got a tool chest to pull from to get themselves out of the situation. Paraphernalia related to alcohol use, you know, obviously any sort of empty uh, bottles around, um, games around uh, the. The funnel here, the blue funnel that says bong on, on top of it, that is a beer bong. Uh, so it's often found at parties where someone puts their mouth up to the end of the hose and somebody pours alcohol down into the top of the funnel and the alcohol comes down very quickly. So they can drink very, very fast that way. Um, so just being aware of what paraphernalia might relate to alcohol and uh, keeping an eye out for it. And then again, the, um, the, the red flags. Uh, again, it's a depressant. So loss of coordination, bloodshot eyes, the smell, or again, those cover-up scents. That's huge with alcohol too. Lots of gum, lots of mouthwash, lots of bug spray or cologne. Any slurring of speech, missing alcohol in your home, any sort of paraphernalia related to it, all are red flags and opportunity for conversation. And that takes us to our next substance, that of inhalants. So Inhalants are um, lots of different items. Anything that has a fume to it or an aerosol to it can be used as an inhale, a lot of nicknames to it. So an inhale is any vapor or gas inhaled on purpose to get a buzz or a high from. Things that youth will use are anything from glue to paint, uh, any sort of gas, whiteout, nitrous whippets. And um, this is making a comeback in middle school from what I've been uh, reading lately that more and more middle schoolers are engaging in this activity because these are products that are very readily accessible to them. And especially when they were home a lot, when school was all online and virtual, they had a little bit more extra time on their hands. So being aware of it and actually talking to your young people about it. Now parents will ask, well, should I talk to my kid about this? Because if I do, won't that make them curious and want to engage or try it out? And what I can say to that is research tells us that that's not accurate, that just because you, you educate your child about something does not automatically make them curious and want to try it out. And instead, you really want to be the first educator because you don't want their first exposure to an inhaler or any drug to be when they are with a group of their friends and there's a lot of peer pressure to go ahead and try it. So instead, it's important to educate our young people, um, you know, late elementary is not too early to start talking about these things, and more importantly, how they get out of that situation. Again, role-playing with them. What do you say? What do you do? How do you say no? How do you get out of the situation? So extremely important. Paraphernalia related to um, inhalant usage. Uh, specifically, in this case, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, whippets, because not everybody's familiar with those. But the little gray canisters toward the upper right hand corner on my slide, they can be blue, they can be gray, they can be black, they're all different colors. Those are whippets. They often come in a box similar to the box on the left that says whip on it because they are made for whip cream makers, which is that cylinder in the bottom right hand corner. So when somebody is trying to make their own homemade whipping cream, they will add the milk and cream and sugar to the canister, mix it all up. Then they attach the, the whippet uh, cylinder to the container and that aerates it. So then they can turn around and spray that on their pie or coffee or whatever it is that they are using. But our youth realize that that gas has a little nitrous in it and it can get them high and give them a little buzz. So they can obtain those fairly easily. Uh, they're, full, they're sold at like General uh, Gordon Foods and other places. And it is a high pressured cylinder so they do have to puncture it which they can do by using a whipped cream maker or that little silver container next to the whipped cream maker is called a cracker, which is fairly easy to find um, on the internet. And they stick the canister in the cracker and screw the top down, that will puncture it and then the gas will come out two holes out of the top. Um, huffing is another name for this. This is extremely popular in parking lots, outside of movie theaters, outside of football games or school events, because again, it's not illegal to be having those canisters. And so it's really hard for law enforcement to do a whole lot. 
which again is why I encourage parents to walk through parking lots outside of events because it can help deter substances like this from being used. Red flags related to inhalants, um, again, they're depriving the brain of oxygen. So breathing issues can occur, confusion, loss of coordination, nauseousness, and if they do enough of them in a short period of time, they can actually lose consciousness and go into seizures. Takes us to our third uh, communication technique and our second short video here. Great soccer game last night. Congrats on the big win. Thanks, it was tough. I had to play more than usual. Did you see Sam? He couldn't get my passes. He was all winded. It was ridiculous. I did see Sam. He looked tired. Has he been staying up too late studying? No, not studying. No? Well, what's going on? Just stuff. Stuff? Care to elaborate? Well, I don't want to get into it, but he has started to vape and smoke. Oh, how do you feel about that? Vaping? It's ridiculous. Smoking is just gross, and it's obviously making it difficult for him to play well. It's frustrating. I'm glad you are smart enough to see that. I am so proud of you for making good decisions when it comes to substance use. And I imagine seeing a friend start down that path is really hard. Thanks, Dad. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And let's think about how we can help Sam. By the way, I love you. Um, so again, this one's really about being involved, you know, showing up, being the biggest cheerleader, the number one fan, as well as getting to know your child really well. Because a lot of times when parents uh, reach out for support, they'll be like, I had no idea that my kid was doing this. And if they really went back and thought through it, they probably could identify a few red flags, but at the time they didn't realize they were red flags. So getting to know your child really well so that when a red flag does pop up, you can identify it right away. You know, again, affirming them, finding places that you can, um, that they can feel where they belong, where they can get their, their self-esteem uh, enhanced and they feel welcomed and, and wanted and needed. Uh, and again, just showing up and being their number one fan or the biggest cheerleader. All of these are ways to enhance the communication in a relationship with our kids, which help us in the long term prevent substance use. With that, we are going on to um, marijuana. Marijuana has many nicknames to it, and it has many more forms to it than it ever did before when um, it was in the big heydays of the 60s and 70s. So a few marijuana facts. So marijuana is a plant that grows in the ground. It has in it over 100 cannabinoid compounds. The two most studied cannabinoid compounds are CBD and THC. Now CBD is a cannabinoid compound that can have an impact on the body without the euphoric high. It can help somebody who has uh, PTSD or uh, anxiety or pain or other issues. The challenge with it right now is we still don't have enough research on it to understand it well enough to prescribe it properly. So, you know, when people go into a dispensary to acquire it or go into um, uh, even a store to get like a CBD lotion or something, the directions aren't real clear on it. It doesn't say take this amount for this long if you have pain and take this amount for this long if you have anxiety. You know, it's kind of a general directions and people really are their own human guinea pig. So they try to see if it will work for them or not. And some people find great relief in the product. Some people do not. So we need more studies on CBD for sure. But in the, usually when it comes to teenagers and marijuana, they're not using it for the CBD, they're using it for the THC. The THC is the mind or mood altering cannabinoid compound in the plant of marijuana. It gives people the high that we think of when we think of marijuana. Um, it has some medicinal benefit, not a whole lot, although many CBD products do have a tiny bit of THC in them to help activate the CBD. The big difference over the last several decades is the, um, the, the THC content. So a plant of marijuana right now has somewhere between 5 and 30% of THC in it. And 30% is a pretty potent plant. Back when you think of the heyday of 60s and 70s, you know, a, a plant that had 12, maybe 15% THC was really, really strong. So we have more than doubled it in the last several decades. And when people are using a plant of marijuana, they are um, typically drying it up and taking the flour and crushing it up and rolling it into a, a joint and smoking it that way. That's typically how the plant is used. Some other paraphernalia related to the plant, we have all sorts of pipes that the plant can be crushed up and dropped into, and then it's smoked that way. Um, some of the homemade uh, pipes that are out there for the plant, you can take a paper towel roller and tin foil to it, a tin can and crush it up and poke holes in it. 
And then there's some hidden ones out there as well. There's little mini flashlights that can be adjusted into a pipe or lipsticks or even highlighters that have been, manipul been manipulated to turn into pipes to smoke marijuana. So this is some of the uh, paraphernalia that is related to the plant itself. In addition, we have um, uh, some of the other paraphernalia that helps hide the use. So the little toilet paper holder that's a dryer sheet over top of it. And so if someone inhales and then blows into that, the dryer sheet will absorb the, the smell. So it's one way they can hide it. Obviously having Febreze or any other air um, uh, th thing to change the smell of the air. But, uh, the top left corner is what's called a grinder. It's a little plastic or metal thing that you put the marijuana plant in and you turn it back and forth and it grinds the plant to make it really fine to be able to put into a pipe. Bottom left hand corner is uh, a fake cell phone. So if your kid has an extra phone and um, you're not really sure about it, it could be a fake cell phone. This one is related to a scale so that someone can measure the amount of product that they have. And then we have Visine, which helps get the red out. We have the little uh, clear test tubes. So when someone has marijuana joints, they might stick them in a test tube to stick in their pocket so they don't squish it. And then the little dice, uh, those are called a roach clip where someone will clip the marijuana cigarette on there so they can smoke it all the way down to the end without burning their fingers. So all of this is paraphernalia related to smoking the plant of marijuana. But in addition to that, we now need to look at the extracts of marijuana. And an extract is where the um, a process, chemical or heat means they extract or pull the THC out of the plant. And depending on how they do that, these are some of the products that are available that are THC extracts. Things called wax and dab and shatter and oil and crumble, all sorts of THC extracts out there. These are somewhere between 50 and 90% THC, extremely, extremely potent products. And literally there's the phrase, a dab will do you, and that's what they mean. The tiniest amount of some of these can have the biggest impact. For example, the oil with the red cap on it, that is a vaping THC oil that can be hooked onto a vape battery in use. And when you look at the directions for that, it has 42 milligrams of THC in every, um, uh, serving. And what a serving basically is, or dosage, I guess you should say, is a three second draw. So one three second inhale on this particular THC vape will keep somebody high for one to four hours. That's how potent it is. And again, teenagers don't realize that, many adults don't even realize that, that that can be actually very overwhelming to a body that hasn't been exposed to THC extract before. This is some of the paraphernalia related to the extracts in terms of using them. They don't get rolled up. They use um, different sorts of pipes on there uh, called a rig. So many of these are, are different types of rigs, homemade rigs, glass rigs, different rigs. And there is uh, the part sticking out is called the nail. And they will use a butane porch, uh, uh, torch or, or, or lighter to heat up the nail so it's really, really, really hot. And this is where they take the dab. So they'll take like a dental tool and take the smallest amount of wax or butter and uh, put it on that nail that's heated up. It will it dissipate very, very quickly. And then they inhale off the pipe that way. And it gets, so it's another, it's another way of using the products other than actually vaping them. But there's still, there's a heat process for them to be able to uh, be able to be used. And again, these things are very, very potent. Very small amounts can keep people high for very long periods of time. Along with the extracts, we have the edibles uh, where the THC is being put in food and pretty much any kind of food can have uh, THC in it these days. From beef jerky to mints to candies to uh, fudge, all sorts of foods can have THC in them. In um, the state of Michigan, one thing our legislator did do when they uh, allowed THC is you won't see packaging like this in the state of Michigan. Our um, law says that packaging is supposed to be um, opaque, so you can't see through it to see the product. And uh, the, de the, the rule is it cannot be enticing to anyone under the age. So the package is supposed to be very plain and generic, not colorful, um, no cartoons on it, nothing that would be attractive to a young person. But this is just some of the examples of the different food products that have THC in them as well. And again, it's really hard to know how much you can eat before you get the THC effect. Um, and if you eat too much, what, um, what the overwhelming effect could be. And then we also have um, what are called uh, elixirs, which are beverages that have THC mixed in them too. So there's THC coffee pods, THC lemonades, THC water, 
The only uh, beverage that cannot have THC in it in the state of Michigan is alcohol. That, that was part of the legislative law too. There, uh, THC cannot be in any alcohol product in our state. I think it is available in other states though. So red flags related to, to, to marijuana. Um, again, it, it's a depressant and a hallucinogen. So they could have slow reactions, poor coordination or anxiety, uh, glassy eyes, mood shifts, munchies, irregular heartbeats, panic attacks. Uh, irrational fears, and they can even go into state of psychosis and end up in the hospital. We've heard way too many stories of young people overdosing primarily on THC extracts and ending up in the hospital. My communication, uh, next tip number four, uh, is about helping your teens choose friends wisely. Friends have a big impact on whether teenagers engage in substance use or not. So helping your kid find um, friends that they, they gel with, but that you know them and you know the parents and you know that you know marijuana and alcohol is not freely available in that kid's house. Those are important things. And remind your kids that uh, rules that apply in your house also apply when they're in somebody else's house. They don't just get to follow somebody else's rules because they're over there. And we encourage parents to um, start having, if they don't already, some sort of code word or message with their, their teenager. Um, that is where a teenager, if they are in a situation they're very uncomfortable in, it helps them get out so they can text it or call and talk to you. And if they say the code word, that's your clue to just say that they need to come home and that you're going to come get them. So it's their out without their friends knowing that they're asking for an out from an adult. So code words can be extremely beneficial. Okay, getting to the last couple of things here, over-the-counter and prescription drugs. So over-the-counter drugs, primarily the ones that are abused are cold medications, anything with coracetin or DXM, dextromethorphan in them, and high quantities, these can cause an out-of-body hallucinogenic experience. So teenagers will literally take a bottle of like NyQuil, drink the whole thing down. Um, they may end up vomiting because it does irritate their stomach, but the DXM can get into their bloodstream and uh, give them this out-of-body hallucinogenic experience. So keeping an eye on that. Keeping an eye on your medicine cabinet at home in general. If you haven't already, we encourage you to move your medicine cabinet out of the mainstream of your home. So any sort of medication is put like in the parent bedroom or someplace where other people do not have access to it. Our prescription drugs, many nicknames for them too. Uh, they are abused more and more now in part because uh, they are prescribed more, and part of that is because they are advertised on TV. So before, pharmaceutical companies had to go to physicians and, and tell physicians this is a medication you might want to prescribe to your patient, and now they can market directly to the patients, and now the patients are going and telling the doctors, you need to give me this medication because you know, I heard on TV it's going to help me. So we, uh, there's not very many countries in the world that allow pharmaceutical companies to directly advertise to the patient, but we are one of them. And so that has increased the amount of prescription drugs that are out there. Teenagers will steal them from friends. They will uh, go into friends' medicine cabinets. So again, making sure that your stuff is put somewhere that if, a, if your, your kid's friend came over, they would not have access to. Selling and trading in schools is still very popular, especially around exam time when it comes to Adderall or Ritalin because those things help people stay up and study. Uh, crushing and snorting can also be uh, uh, very popular. And then farming parties. Farming parties are where kids go to an, a party of some sort at somebody's house and the admission is a pill. And you drop the pill in the bucket and then mix them all out. And during the party, they'll call up farmer picks and everyone reaches in there and grabs a pill and takes it. Obviously, you can see the dangers in that because they don't really know what they're taking. And if they're mixing it with something else, it could be extremely dangerous. So again, having conversations with your kids about these things. In terms of prescription drugs, there's three kind of categories we touch on. Stimulants, again, those are the ones prescribed for ADD and ADHD, uh, the Ritalin, the Concerta, uh, other amphetamines. Um, these, again, are popular, especially around exam time because they are stimulant, they help kids stay up at night to study. But the, the dangers of that, again, it's a stimulant, so it's going to increase this, the um, cardiovascular system, it's going to put uh, stress on the heart, and it can be extremely addictive. So talking to our kids about the dangers of this. The depressants or sedatives, they are prescribed to treat anxiety or sleep disorder, so Xanax and Valium. Um, and some kids will use these because they feel that they're stressed out and they need something to calm their nerves down. But again, artificial depressant can have, is, is similar to alcohol, can have a very negative impact on the body, slowing down the whole natural, central nervous system without a prescribed reason to, to just do it on your own. And then, of course, we have the pain relievers and narcotics, 
prescribed for pain, Vicodin, Narco, Percocet, Oxycontin. We are doing much better as a medical community on not prescribing these. And if you've had to get one of these for a surgery or something lately, you know um, how many papers you had to sign. So we are doing much better to keep control of the amount of prescription that is out there because we know that the wide prescribing of this product is what led to our opioid epidemic. And so they're doing much better with that. But these are still prescribed for young people. And most commonly it's through getting wisdom teeth out or having some sort of uh, athletic uh, injury. So again, if those happen to your kids, talking to the physician, talking to the, the dentist or the oral surgeon about other options besides a narcotic or having the smallest amount possible for the shortest period of time so they can get off them as quickly as they can. Uh, red flags related to these, again, depending on if it's a stimulant or a depressant, it can be all, all over the board from being intoxicated looking to reflex uh, impairment, heart rate going faster, slower, uh, pupils being constricted or dilated, sweating, slurred speech, dry mouth, a whole bunch of different things. Anything that is just, again, the red flag, knowing your child well so you know if they're off and being off could mean that they're under the influence. And that brings us to heroin real quick um, because uh, we know that the, again, pay relievers led to the heroin epidemic. So heroin is, um, comes in different forms, a black tar or a white powder derived from the opioid family. It's a downer, it slows the body down. It also interferes with the brain's ability to perceive pain. Uh, it is definitely still an epidemic going on. We still have way too many people dying of heroin overdoses right now. Purity is an issue. It's often mixed with fentanyl, um, which is too powerful for the human body to be able to recover from. Uh, indications of red flags related to heroin, drowsiness, constricted pupils, slow breathing, confusion, dizziness, slurred speech, depression, clammy skin, our needle marks are all big red flags. Lastly, we'll, we'll hit on stimulants before we wrap up here. Um, stimulants uh, are things that speed up the central nervous system artificially. Many nicknames out there. But the primary ones are methamphetamine which is a synthetic stimulant. It's made from the pseudocedrine cold medicine, which is why to acquire pseudocedrine, you have to uh, meet with a pharmacist and sign off and show your ID. They did that law several years ago to help cut down on meth production. It's kind of a chameleon of drugs. You can get meth in um, pretty much any way you want it, from pills to uh, rocks to um, powders. There's a whole variety of ways to get methamphetamine. Cocaine is still out there. It is not a primary drug among our teenagers, but it is still very prevalent and um, very uh, available, but it's also one of the more expensive substances out there. Then ecstasy. Ecstasy is a stimulant as well as a hallucinogen combination drug. It's completely man-made. It's found at rave parties primarily. It gives somebody, um, again, the stimulant to stay up all night dancing, but also hallucinogens so that it's heightened sensory awareness, which is why people are attracted to it. Some red flags related to ecstasy, uh, hard candies like uh, the ring pop and necklace, because when people are under the influence of ecstasy, they, their uh, jaw clenches and they grind their teeth. So they will have hard candies available to chew on to help prevent that um, clenching while they are under the influence. Red flags from stimulants, obviously, um, uh, again, hyper, if they're hyper, they're, uh, or they can't sleep, their heart rate's beating really hard, constricted pupils, increased energy, those all could be a red flag. All right, my last little communication thing, and we're going to wrap up real quick with safes. I think I might be a minute over, but I'm going to be really close hey, to on what time. what are you looking for? Chips, I'm hungry. How about an apple, like me? They are the kind you really like. Yeah, okay, that sounds good. Thanks. Did you run already today? I did. Would love to have you go with me tomorrow. It would also give us a chance to catch up. Hmm, okay but only if you take me out to dinner after. Ha, huh, sure, if you can keep up. Oh, you can count on that. I love you. And this one was just about being a, a good role model for our kids. It's so important. You know, the do as I say, not as I do doesn't really work with people of any age. Uh, and healthy choices do rub off on our kids. The more they see us doing um, healthy, making healthy choices, the more likely they are to as well. So that wraps up our communication techniques, you know, establishing and maintaining that communication, being involved with your kid's life, having clear rules and expectations and enforcing them, 
role modeling our behavior and helping our kids choose friends wisely. Those five things can, are really um, gonna help with our protective bubble. All right, last but not least, where to look. So these are called safes on the internet. If you look them up, uh, they're um, hiding places though. So some of them that are out there, the top left one is a, a fake lipstick case that's hollowed out in the bottom. That watch in the upper um, middle there can come apart and the bottom left shows you that you can pull the face off and again, hide things in it. The ink pen's not an ink pen at all. It's just a hollowed out test tube where things can go. The hairbrush, the top can come off. The commuter cup, this particular one, the top half of it is actually where you could put a liquid in to drink it. The bottom half is completely hollowed out. The Coke can is a totally fake Coke can, you screw the top off. The water bottle, totally a fake water bottle, you can pull it apart. The candle, the bottom of the candle um, opens up and it's emptied out. The top of the candle does work like a candle though, so it appears like it's just, just a candle. <laughs> Uh, books. Books can easily be hollowed out to put things in. Pillows can be hollowed out to put things in. Stuffed animals can be hollowed out to put things in. So if you're, if you think your kid might be doing something and, but you're not finding anything obvious in their room, look for the less than obvious. There's many, many ways to be able to hide things. Things to um, look for. I gave you some of the specifics that they're under the influence, but in general, again, if they get an MIP minor possession, remember it's never the first time. If they get caught with something, they're going to say, oh, it's not mine, or oh, I just got it. You know, it's not the first time that they're actually caught. Preoccupation. If a lot of the essays or videos that they're watching on YouTube or things that they're writing about in school relates to drug use, that can be a red flag. Obviously, if you find paraphernalia. If they had increased in being dishonest with you or being very secretive, if they have a bag or a purse or backpack and they never let it go, that's a red flag. If they have real big changes in their sleeping or eating patterns, if they start to withdraw from the family and friends, physical appearance, drastic physical appearance changes, their attitude about schoolwork or truancy changes, their money needs change. Those are all potential red flags. And what can adults do? Again, we can continue to learn. We keep talking to our kids, increase our risk factors, decrease the uh, Increase the protective factors, decrease the risk factors, and follow up, follow up, follow up. It's not a one-time conversation. We need to continue following up with our kids. Act now if you're concerned and reach out and get support. You know, the biggest challenges we have when it comes to this, but if, there, if there's a kid who might be in trouble, is parents are fearful. You know, what are others going to think of me? Maybe I'm a bad parent. If we put this out in the open, it's going to ruin my kid's chances for life. Or they're in denial. You know, it's just a phase. My kids can outgrow it. This isn't a big deal. It's experimenting with drugs is normal. Teenage behavior, everybody does it. And we can handle this as a family and keep it quiet. We don't need any help. Well, unfortunately, uh, mental health and drug use are still very stigmatized in our society. And we do need to reach out and get help. And we need to support families that are in need and, and are reaching out to us and give them the help that we can. So I know I'm two minutes over, a little bit. So uh, just wrapping up, so we talked about risk and protective factors, the brain, substances, safe hiding place, changes, communication, and what we can do as parents. I hope you found this helpful tonight. Again, thank you to the Huron Valley Community Coalition for hosting this tonight and inviting me in. Uh, and we're here for any questions that you may have before we totally wrap up. So Jordan, I'm gonna give it back to you with a question and answer session. Yep, uh, so Cheryl, uh, uh, Cheryl, I do have one for you. Um, and I didn't want to interrupt you when we were saying, it's back when you were talking about vaping and show the chart. Um, can you clarify what the um, unit of measurement was for that? There was no scale um, on it. So was it percentage of youth surveyed or total number of youth? Um, can you just speak to that? Yes, it was percentages. And um, again, because the 2021 data said don't compare it to years in past, I didn't put the actual percentages on it. I think right now, um, middle school was just over 2% and high school was down to like 12%. So of kids that have taken the survey, 12% have said that they vaped in the last 30 days. And I think it was two and a half of middle school. So equaling just over 2 million kids in the United States. Awesome. Thank you. If anyone else has any questions, if you want to send them over in the Q&A or the chat, um, we can share those with uh, Cheryl as well. Or uh, Randy did put our emails in there. Um, so if you have any questions for the coalition, you can send us an email. I know this is kind of a lot to process tonight. Um, so if you have any questions or you're concerned about a warning sign um, or want to know some different tips and tricks that you can do to keep your house secure and things like that, uh, the coalition is here to help you. Yeah, and I just want to say, Cheryl, 
wow, because man, that's a lot of work. I know it's a lot for people to uh, take on, but I think, uh, you know, the, the, as long as we're going to have a recording of this, it's great. We're going to get it out to everybody and, they'll, and they can come back and look at it again. And I sure hope you'll share it with your, your friends, other parents that you know, uh, friends and family members. But um, if, if you can just remember this one thing, then you'll be able to go back and get the data and the, and the information, you know, the specifics. But just remember that you have tremendous power as a parent. You are the number one influencer on whether your children use drugs or alcohol or not. I don't care what people say about it being, you know, a rite of passage and, and uh, uh, you know, a normal behavior for kids to experiment with drugs and alcohol. If they know where you stand on it and you explain it to them and you maintain the open communication lines that Cheryl has encouraged you to, to, to do, you will definitely have a real positive influence on, uh, on their behavior. So... Remember that piece of it. Remember to share the video with your friends. And um, and I think you're going to be able to do a lot to help us lead teams toward a drug and alcohol-free life here in Huron Valley. Awesome. It does look, doesn't look like we have any other questions. The other thing I did want to add is the Huron Valley Community Coalition is going to be sending out um, a mailer to any secondary households. So if you're in Huron Valley schools um, of a sixth grader on up, you'll be receiving a mailer that has some other tips and tricks that the coalition finds helpful, some conversation builders, things like that, um, that you'll be receiving in the next couple of weeks. So take a look at your mail and we're here for you. Parent power. Up, oh, Cheryl, okay. you have one more question that just came in. Okay. Uh, the question is, can you give an example of how a parent can ask about their friend's home? Um, uh, I find it to be most direct is best. And it, you know, it's real simple. Um, it, it's, it's simple, but it's hard. I will I'll say that, you know, cause it's the same thing with, with guns. I do that as my kids have grown up through elementary school too. If they were going to a friend's house, I would directly ask, are there guns in your house and are they locked up? And, you know, it might kind of come across kind of, you know, like I'm a crazy lady, but truly other parents have appreciated me just asking the question. So I think it's okay to ask the question, you know, is there, um, is there alcohol, marijuana, or any other drug accessible in your home? And, you know, then you decide if they say, you know, yes or no, then, uh, you know, would you please make sure it's locked up when my kid comes over? Or there's different ways to have the conversation, but I find that the direct question is definitely the simplest, uh, although it's sometimes challenging because you don't want to be that parent, but at the same time, it's more important about keeping your kids safe. And a lot of parents actually just appreciate you asking them directly versus beating around the bush or, um, you know, trying to find out by asking another parent. I think that's important too. I think you just got to ask if you don't know that if they're going to a new kid's um, new friend's home. But you know, part of this can be um, addressed in in your conversations with friends at, at sporting events or um, you know plays, you know, or just hanging around with your friends and neighbors, letting them know. But what we know through our research is that uh, when it comes to alcohol, alcohol, for example, the most likely place for kids to get it is at their home or their homes to their uh, friends. And so um, if you can share, you know, in kind of just general conversation, that, hey, this is a really risky thing. If you're leaving uh, um, alcohol and I guess now marijuana uh, is, is legal for parents to have around too. If you're doing so, um, you're really putting that out there for kids uh, to, to get their hands on. And so we need to kind of do, as a group, as, as, as parents in this community, we need to understand that that's a very risky behavior for us and that we need to monitor our alcohol at home. And you'll see in that mailing that Jordan was talking about that one of the things that we encourage is using uh, tamper-resistant tape that you can put over the uh, bottles and other containers of alcohol. And you'll, then you'll be sending the message to your kids that you are monitoring it. And of course you will actually be able to do so. Um, and it lets them know you're serious about it. So um, talk to your friends and neighbors too, you know, just to, even when it's not uh, sort of in a confrontational uh, situation. Hey, Carol, or Cheryl, we have two more questions. Um, and respect for your time, if anyone has to hop off, you're more than welcome. But if you wanna stay for this Q and A, uh, we have Cheryl for another couple of minutes here. Um, Cheryl, what is the main reason fentanyl is laced in drugs? It's cheaper. It's cheaper for the drug dealers to acquire it. And so they will mix it in there because their goal is to make money. So if they can find a cheaper product to mix it in, then that's what they are going to do. I mean, it's not just 
fentanyl is the big thing right now, but there's, you know, drain cleaner, there's baking soda, there's a million things mixed in when someone's purchasing heroin. And it's just to the dealer's benefit. Awesome. Thank you. Um, another one that just came in, do school staff have a responsibility to take some control when they see students involved with drug use on school campus? Well, that, that's a personal opinion. I don't know what the school district rules are, so. Um, I, well, I don't well know. yeah, indeed, indeed, they, if they if they know that there's something going on drugs and alcohol, they get on it right away. We have school resource officers, and we have um, behavioral specialists, and of course the the uh, principals, assistant principals, and all the and all the teachers are very uh, yeah, very in tune with that sort of thing. If they see that kind of behavior, they they report it. Kids are pretty sneaky, you know, and you've seen a lot of the ways they can be they can be sneaky. It's easier than it's ever been. Uh, it's easy to conceal vaping. It's easy to conceal marijuana use, primarily with vaping. So um, I can tell you, I, my office is at Milford High School. I can tell you that people are on high alert all the time, and that they don't take that uh, issue lightly. Yeah, and as Cheryl mentioned too, uh, you know, talking about if you see something in the in the parking lots before the events and things like that, you know, saying something to administrator when you're a parent walking into the building or if you're worried about something. Um, they can't be everywhere and have eyes, but if I'm, or you hear your kids say something or they're worried about this or a particular bathroom or something like that, make sure, you know, send a quick email or talk to administrator so they know what's going on too. Okay. Um, if there's any other questions, you can send them on over. If not, I think we're going to wrap up for the night here. I'll give you another minute. And again, I just want to encourage everybody, if you have questions that come to you later, please, please check in with us. You know, you've got our email address in the chat. You can also go to hvcoalition.org. That's our website. There's lots of good stuff there. Um, and, and, and watch your mail because, as Jordan said, we've got a mailing coming up here shortly that's going to give you some more tips and, uh, and tools that you can use. Um, we're also offering um, at-home alcohol and marijuana tests that you can request from us, and we'll send them on to you. That's another kind of, I, I, I understand where some people feel kind of weird about having those at home, but think of it this way. If you have, uh, for example, an air, a milk, alcohol test at home um, and your kids see that, not only do they know that you're serious about the drug and alcohol policies at your place uh, and that you're willing to use it, but they can also tell their friends, hey, I, I can't drink. My folks, they suspect me drinking. They're going to test me. And they're going to find out, and then I'm going to be in big trouble. So, you know, it's kind of some people think that that that's sort of accusatory, but you know, it's it's. I, I guess I would advise you to tell your kids it's not that I don't trust you; it's just that I don't trust any kid when they're under a lot of pressure to to, to fit in with uh with the crowd and you know be tempted to do things that they know is not in their best interest. So a question just came in. I'm going to type that website in the chat for you. So this is our website at, for the Heron Valley Community Coalition. Um, you can also find us on social media accounts. If you have any questions, you can message us there as well. Anything else, folks? Okay. You know where to find us now, and we're happy to help in any way we can. We're all in this together. That's what a community coalition is all about, community, building a coalition amongst all of us uh, and help each other and make it a better, safer place for our kids to live and learn and for our families to live. So if that's it, I guess we can call it a night. We're good. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Cheryl, thank you again. Outstanding.